point. We're living in a, you know, a punto, modern age of uh, punto. the new psychedelic renaissance. And I thought, this is, this is not real. This is, uh, uh, my gosh, I'm on the radio. People hear me. You know, what we do with our time here on the planet and, uh, you know, how we give to others and affect others' lives and uh, what we do with it is important. Oh, wait a minute. I didn't know that's the direction we were going. <laughs> that every major spiritual tradition says, you know, the kingdom of heaven is within. It's about what makes you happy and satisfied. Like you said, like you just said, you have to be able to control it. You can't let it control you. Always part of me wanted an audience. It's naive to think that human beings have stopped evolving. The, the world is a very rich place if you start exploring. Perfect. Excellent. Okay. So, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the to the podcast Point Counterpoint. Today, I am joined by Roland Enos, and uh, you can introduce yourself. Just tell me a little bit about uh, who you are, uh, what you're what you're interested in. Hi, well, I'm I'm Roland Enos. I'm uh, 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 I'm a visiting professor in the biological science at the University of Hull, but I've long been interested in the biomechanics of organisms and much more recently of wood and how wood is used. Yes, that's super interesting. Uh, so um, your, your, new, your new book uh, that just came out, The Age of Wood, Our Most Useful Material and the Construction of Civilization. Um, do, you want, uh, do you want to explain a little bit about that is and you know, how important wood was in you know, the development of civilization? Well, I think that wood is our most vital material. And in fact, that our whole history of humanity and uh, from even from 60 million years ago, even before we became human, right up until maybe 100 years ago, and even today, would always been our most important material. And it's fleshing though that story out over that 60 year time span that my book's all about. Uh, so that rather than being the history of humanity being of Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age, I think it all could it all, all be called the Wood Age, and that's the idea of the book. Exactly, fascinating. So, um, you know, wood is so important for, you know, the construction of, of you know, different objects, buildings, um, and also, it's also crucial for the development of all sorts of different other materials, like stone. So, uh, Want to explain like how important it is in that? Well, um, yeah, I mean, people talk about the Stone Age. So, so uh, from about um, two million years ago, humans were using stone tools, and they talk about how important that was. But in fact, uh, most of the tools that were being used at that time that humans were using were in fact made of wood. And what the major use of those uh, stone tools was actually to carve wooden tools. So as long ago as one and a half million years ago in East Africa, uh, there's evidence of that some of these early uh, Aculean technology stone tools, as we call them, uh, they were actually being used to carve wood. And there's the remains of little bits of shavings of wood on those, those stone tools. Mm -hmm. So what is the mix that makes wood just so special? Like what properties? Uh, does it have? Well, wood, wood's uh, an amazing material, really. It's, it's as stiff and as strong and as tough, weight for weight, as steel. Um, and that's a consequence of the fact that it's made up, it's a very complicated um, composite material made of a very, very stiff fiber called cellulose in a soft matrix, and rather like carbon fiber uh, materials. That makes the material very, very stiff and combines the best properties of both materials and it would has a special toughening mechanism also which means as you're pulling wood apart you're sort of having to unwind lots of fibers which takes huge amounts of energy uh, which is why it's so difficult to cut through wood from one side and it's why uh, wood is such a much better material at withstanding buffets than things like stone which falls apart if you hit it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's much, it's you know, it's it's not as brittle, so you know, it 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 has the ability to bend, you know. Um, 
So it um, can bend, it can withstand all. Yeah, it's, it's it's amazing material. It's it's quite fantastic. Um, so uh, and then what are some of the different uses that uh, for different types of wood? Because obviously different, you know, you know, oak is going to be different than pine, which is different than uh, maple, yeah. or whatever. Uh, well, well, there is that there are very different types of wood, and that depends on the sort of tree. So, so that fast growing trees have very light wood, so they can produce a thick as trunk as possible. Things like balsa wood or poplar, and they're very good mostly for sort of packing materials. So balsa was when you made balsa wood models when you were a child, maybe I certainly used to. Mm. But mm -hmm. it was also used as sort of packing material uh, and making pallets out of is poplar. Um, then when it comes to the big, big trees that grow in the forest, things like oaks and beeches, that's what medium density would be good for construction purposes and for carving. And then when you get to uh, trees which grow in the understory of forest, thing like, uh, things like ebony, or, or uh, holly, um, or, or wood. Wood is very dense, it's very dark, and that's very hard. It's very used carving into very thin objects to find that, that uh, statues and things, a lot of are made out of those nice hardwoods. Some instruments are made out of those hardwoods uh, because they conduct sound very well, very fast. You get a nice bright tune of ornaments uh, have inlaid patterns, marquetry of ebony and rose, uh, make beautiful objects. Yeah. So, um, you know, you know, I like, I like what a lot, you know, you know, for example, when I carve, you know, one thing I, I like to use is, um, you know, mm. some fresh basswood, you know, it's, it's nice and soft. It carves oh, very yeah. easily. Yeah. Um, and another very nice wood, you know, is you know willow, which is very popular with you know with you know the way that the yeah. ancient that the ancient Irish used to make their coracles with, uh, uh, you know, when they would weave those the That's round right. boats. Yeah, it's willows are one of those very light woods, easy to carve. But the best wood you're talking about, made from lime trees, that was used by the best carvers ever back in the 18th century. People like Grinling Gibbons. Uh, such a uh, fine grain and the grain is all even and that you can he was able to carve incredibly detailed carvings showing things like the ears of corn and violins complete with even the strings where of just out of the out of the basswood uh, and even today when you make a metal when you make bowls in order to make metal to make metal components those are often carved out of out of basswood because it's simply the best uh, and most beautiful wood to carve. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, yeah. Also, also, there's uh, there's of course the the element of curl in some woods. You know, which um, is, is there been any, any historical use for for that? You know, like with the you know curl, curly maple, for example, or uh, it's mostly they're curly, but so mostly they're. Uh, mostly used for, for decoration purposes. Mm. They tend to be, if you're looking for a big wood, it's a good idea to curl in. Uh, but if you're, but the curl tends, to, uh, and you get lots of sort of ring, ring of grain around the branch trees. And one of my PhD students, uh, uh, Duncan Slater, was able to show just how well some of those little rings of, of of which be branch joints of trees so that they they didn't split apart and uh, that's why the tree branches not a weak point when the branch uh, uh, splits off from the tree. Yeah. Um, so another thing I was wondering was um, when when you look at you know early human societies, what would have been one of the more common woods that they would have used, or maybe a variety of them? But um, and then what, what what would those have been have been very useful for? Well, well, probably the new societies they would have they would have uh, uh, come down from the trees uh, in East Africa uh, in the Van area. So they would have probably used a, a lot of acacia wood, uh, 
still there's still very low temperatures in the tropics. It dries out nicely, uh, so that they would also be able to to build their fires out and make digging things out of it, make spears, and uh, and make huts as well to protect them from the sun to keep them warm at night. Uh, so that's humans evolving in Africa as they move towards Europe and other areas. One of the first wooden tools that's actually been discovered, the first one of the first pieces of carpentry were spears, which were found in in foggy conditions in um, in, in Germany, in West Germany, in Saxony, and those uh, were actually carved out of very slow growing spruce trees. It must have been very cold at the time. The trees are very slow growing and they made them into spears. They carved them beautifully so they look very much like the spears that uh, Olympic athletes, the javelins that Olympic athletes throw. And they were used, they used those, as was about 3,000 years ago, they used those to kill horses, which they sort of cut off at some big lake. And uh, Working together, so these people must have been very sophisticated hunters and really clever people about a thousand years ago, even before our modern species of humans uh, evolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, another thing that you that you talk about is um, how wood has influenced our evolution uh, throughout throughout the many years. Uh, do you want uh, to uh, yeah. talk on that? Well. We all think that we're unique uh, and, and that we obtained our characteristics of humans uh, with, uh, because we're by people. But in fact, it's clear that we share most of the characteristics that we usually think of as human, like our pads, fingernails, gripping hands, binocular vision, arms to grasp and, and legs to turn kind of around with. But it's, we share all of those uh, with the rest of the primates. And of course, the rest of the primates are basically arboreal. So they lived in a woody environment. So we actually evolved our body shape, was in fact evolved to be a, uh, an arboreal animal, one in, in the trees. And it, it just happened that, that it's actually been really useful for us as we came down from the trees, we've always back to those uh, characteristics have been useful for us for getting about making tools and generally human and arms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, you know, really, um, our our ancestors know we we've all like the the perfect tools to be able to shape some of these tools. You know, yeah. we got we got the the opposable thumbs. You know, we're able to. Manip manipulate everything uh, very well. We're, we're, we're very right. dexterous. And not only that, but we also, it seems that we also gained our, a lot of intelligence by having to live in the, in the canopy. It's quite easy to live in the canopy if you're a small organism, but once you start getting larger, the great tapes are closest relatives, then you not only, then you have to be. Uh, much more and it seems likely that we evolved our that they they evolved their large brains which we which we uh, inherited in order to be able to travel more safely uh, around the forest canopy moving between trees putting on several branches things like orangutans are marvelous at actually being very careful and they never fall out of this really heavy creatures uh, and so much of my theory is that we evolved our uh, our large brains, or the great apes did, did which we inherited, in order to uh, travel better through the trees. And then, once they had those brains, they've also used them to design the first wooden tools. Uh, and all great apes make amazing nests, which they use by cleverly bending all the branches of their tree out of the trees and breaking them in set ways. They know about the mechanics of trees and, and the mechanics of wood more than most people do. And that's given them a good night's sleep and allowed them to sort of evolve, uh, evolve uh, bellow brains because they had such a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. that's, in, that's interesting. So, you know, it, it allows us to 
to evolve better brains because you know we were able to sleep better and able to to be more productive. Well, that's right. I think everyone knows just how terrible you feel uh, if you don't have a good night's sleep. And a good night, long night sleep to go into rapid eye movement sleep and dream. Those are the sorts of things you need to be able to do in order to, to recharge your memories. And that's something that the that monkeys really can't do because they they have to sit on branches uh, uh, rather precarious and they get pretty rot rotten night's sleep uh, and they don't dream anywhere near as much as humans do or, or even the great apes. That's interesting. So uh, you're basically saying that, you know, in part, uh, the ability to, you know, to, dr to dream in the quantity that we do, um, as well as getting good night's sleep is crucial to our development as a civilization. That's, uh, that became particularly crucial when we came down from the trees because uh, once you're on the forest floor, uh, then you have a terrible being eaten by predators. Uh, about three million years ago, East Africa was even more dangerous than it is now. The lions and hyenas and things we get now, but there were huge uh, saber-toothed tigers and other, and even uh, a lion, which is a species which is even bigger than today. So obviously it's incredibly dangerous. And uh, the baboons that live on the, on the, fo or, or in the, uh, on the forest floor, on the floor nowadays, they do, don't get much decent sleep at all, even though they're in a huge groups, they're always having to wake up and make sure they're not getting stalked. Um, and, my theory is that the reason humans could stay on the floor was that we actually used the wood, took the wood down or got wood and built fires of it to keep predators away. So because we were safe, then we were actually then able to help develop, help our brains develop into the huge organs, about twice as big as, a, as an ape's brain that we have nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what what allowed us to you know take care of our basic needs you know more efficiently and you know allow us to allow give us that extra free time to use for whatever other endeavors that that we want to pursue. That's right, because the um, having having uh, w wood fires not only enabled us to sleep better but also enabled us to cook our food, uh, and that softened it. So it's easy to eat, so we could, develop, we could rejoice of our teeth, uh, but it also meant that we could digest it chemically better. Uh, we didn't need to do so much. We didn't need to have a big, big uh, pod stomach uh, to digest the food. So we, that gave us some hours more uh, time where we could sit around the campfire and talk or, or go out and, and do some more hunting, whereas things like chimpanzees, uh, they they still have to use, uh, uh, spend huge amounts of time chewing, even though they tend to sleep really hard. So um, the fact that we could use wood to make fires is another it's lucky for us that wood is actually flammable. As it dries out, it, it's quite easy to burn. And so wood was crucial in enabling us to, as you say, free our time. I'm afraid to get some night's sleep and then actually uh, be able to spend time talking, learning how to, and making better tools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, are, are there any other examples of, you know, um, other non-human apes that are using wood uh, for tools uh, besides, besides, of course, the, the nests that are built? Uh... Yeah. Yeah, very much so. In fact, yes, the... Uh, the, the best tool users are chimpanzees. Uh, quite a lot of chimpanzees make uh, use little pieces of wood which they stick into termites' nests. That's a common behaviour. They stick the wood into the termites' nest, draw it out with an ant, and eat the ants. But they also some tool some uh, chimp in Africa in savannas. They also uh, use tools to into nests on. Um, of uh, a bee, a bee's bee's nest, and have several 
get in there, then then to sort of remove it. So they've got got wooden tools to made these pieces. Another sort have digging sticks, which they use to dig uh, dig, dig roots as well in savannas. And another savanna chimpanzee out in West Africa in Senegal, they've actually developed spears. It's the females that develop them. They break a branch off, remove leaves, and then these stab into the holes in trees to stab bush babies, bring them out and eat them. So it looks like a, a, a warfare almost, tools to, to kill other things. That's that's something that our ancestors he must have taken those wooden tools and developed them to make our own spears and digging sticks and nests and parts like that. So we're following the tradition of our eight cousins, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that last one, that one sounded uh, pretty relevant with the warfare <laughs> type of stuff. It, you can see where we shop when they found that. There was it was a lady called Jill Pruett who found that only about 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And of course, before that, we had the idea that, that chimpanzees were, were killing animals using that sort of tech, using that sort of technique. So it was a push to anthropologists to work it to see that, that what we used to think of as particularly human uh, is something that the, which is also the apes did as well. The one thing we do do, do is that we make stone tools to make wooden tools. Eight, they just break a bit of branch off and then make the, then strip it and make have the tool. What we have to, do to make a, a wooden tool is to make a stone tool first and then use that stone tool to carve our wooden tools. It's a rather more complex process. We can make better tools. But that shows that we have to have a much more big donation to do what I want to make a wooden tool. So first of all, I've got to make this other tool and then I can use that tool to make the wooden tool. So it's sort of twice as complex, really, uh, but it produces much better tools. That's the advantages we have uh, over the eight. Yeah. Um... Yeah, so you know, ch chimpanzees are, you know, of course, very violent uh, in their cultures compared to their very, very close uh, relatives, the, the bonobos, who are uh, you mm. know, much, much less violent and more. As they resolve their conflicts with sex instead of violence, and uh, you know, matriarchal instead of patriarchal societies. Um, another thing I wanted to ask about was um, how how is it that wood is still shaping our civilization, our evolution uh, today, or or in more recent years? Oh, well, we still use uh, large amounts of wood, of course. Uh, one of the main uh, main ways we use wood is, of course, our shape. What people think is that we still make books out of wood. Uh, paper is is a wood, and we it was only about about 150 years ago that we learned how to make. Uh, paper out of wood. Before that, people used to make uh, paper out of out of um, out of rags, out of out of cloth. Uh, but it was quite difficult to. If you've got wood out of uh, paper out of wood, what you've got to do is remove uh, the lignin, and so which is a component, and which makes the wood and makes the paper go yellow. So. Uh, that was developed in the late nine, 19th century. And nowadays, we still use loads and loads of paper. It's much cheaper than using rags to make paper. Uh, and that helped to make papers cheaper, book books cheaper, and it really democratised the world that we know it. So that nowadays, everyone can afford a book, everyone can afford a newspaper. And it, that really revolutionised the world as we know it. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, the other thing I want to get into was uh, more environmental issues. So, um, so did you, uh, did you talk about, at all about you know deforestation and that sort of thing? Well, yes, very much so because uh, obviously we've used lots of wood, and there's been a lot of deforestation. Uh, it's one of the uh, things that people think that most deforestation is because we want wood. That's not true, actually, because most issues occurred on the planet 
uh, like in Britain, for instance, we only have about 10% tree cover. That's not wood, it's because we wanted the land which the trees were growing on so we could grow our own crops. Uh, and we have 10% tree cover is because we find the wood so useful. So we haven't stripped that final 10%. Um, and if you have nice broadleaf woodland, what you find is that people tended to have cut it down and in the east in the United States, of course, uh, to grow to grow crops. And uh, it's when people, when industrialization started that extensive deforestation for wood itself happened. And that tended to be, particularly in America, that tended to be the uh, softwood, the conifer, conifers. So that's in the late 19th century, that's when the deforestation of the Great Lakes area occurred around, around Chicago, where you are. Yeah. And uh, that once that was cut down and, and stripped, they moved on to the south of America, around, around Florida, where one of the pine was, was, was cut down. And then now, more nowadays, it's up in the Pacific Northwest where there's lots of deforestation. And since that's not enough, as society's moved on, then it's finally moved over to the, um, to the Far East and, and the Amazon, where tropical rainforests are being cut down. For cutting their rainforest down, we've already cut our forest down and, and it happened. And and now we're wanting more wood, so we're going over to the to the tropics nowadays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm here in Minnesota, and where there's of course a, a lot of uh, white pines, which is uh, a great wood. Um, right. So um, one one thing that's kind of famous around here is this place called the Lost Forty. I'm not sure if you're aware of that, but it's this place where there's years yeah. ago there was like a surveying error, and they missed like 40 acres of trees. So there's a bunch of like old growth white pines that were never cut oh, down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, because uh, that's fascinating because I, I've been to Michigan where there's just 20 pine forests in Michigan left in, in the southern, in the peninsula of Michigan. It's good to know that there's, there's more, but it's just a tiny remnant of what was there. Of course, the white pine was, was incredibly important and hickory pine was the, the, the tree that the British were so keen on on harvesting uh, so that we could uh, make masks for our ships back in the 18th century. In fact, we, we were so horrible to the, to the American colonists, we, we said that these are our trees, keep off, and uh, instituted a policy where American colonists weren't allowed to use those. But obviously they got rather annoyed and start using themselves, um, and it all culminated right at the 1772 uh, with a uh, with a big fight called the Pine Tree Riot, where where the where some people came to fighting uh, to, to some uh, people in New Hampshire for cutting down white pine trees, and and then they were stricken by the the colonists. At what, in what's known as the Pine Tree Riot, which became a prototype, uh, gave an inspiration for people for next year to have the Boston Festival uh, where people, of course, protesting against the British taxes. Uh, but the it was these British Hello? Slight one factors to the start of the Revolutionary War. And of course, because the British were then cut off from the supply of arbors, that meant that a lot of our ships didn't have masts during that war. And that's one reason why you're independent and why you're the country now, and Britain is just the little, little minnow player in the mm -hmm. world stage. Mm -hmm. You got your independence back in the early. Because of wood, yep. Uh, because of wood, yeah. Yeah, so um, so so the 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 crown uh, outlawed uh, colonists from chopping down the trees so they could be so they could be used for the for the ships. For the ship's masts. 
Yeah. Imagine this mass, about 100 50 foot long. And then how difficult to cut a tree down when it's mast intact. You can drag it down, float it down the river, sail it all the way across the Atlantic to Britain, where then we could build our ships. So it was an amazing undertaking. Uh, and you might say, well, why didn't the British use their own masts? And the thing is that we never had any trees that were big enough in Britain. All mm. our trees were, were, were things like oak trees. Mm. We'd long since harvested them. We'd long since uh, just had, had woods and, and small trees. So we, we could get our wood in, get an uh, oak tree, oak in from, from the Baltic. But really good sort of, of, of really big uh, trees for mass was, was the United States. So that's why uh, we, one of the big advantages we used to think of having that colony over in the other side of the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm originally from uh, Bemidji, Minnesota, which was a, a big uh, logging yeah. town there. And, you know, uh, you know, like in the early 1900s, late 1800s, there's a, you know, they would they chop the trees down there and you know float them down the river they'd be the the guys that go out in there and they 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 walk on the logs in fact there's still a tradition uh where they do these competitions where of log rolling where people will uh the one person will will try to walk on the log walking in one direction the other mm -hmm. person's walking the other direction on the other end of the log and you try to spin the other guy off the thing which is kind of based off of that um but anyway so we're there were and you know i actually you know, on the lake that I live on, there's a bunch of white pines. But yeah. where I'm from is uh, kind of, we have the most famous uh, statue of Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox, who was, you know, of right. course, a, a mythical log, logger in, uh, in the United States. <laughs> so yeah. Woods influenced well, our folklore. He has, and, and, but it's, it's, it's amazing how little there is to remind people your logging days i went to around the great lakes to in, when i was in michigan i went to a town called muskegon which was another logging town also on the shores of lake michigan and uh, an amazing thing was there wasn't much remaining from that time of the town because the problems was well i, I stayed in the bed and breakfast which was lovely it was a sort of massive great uh house which obviously belonged to a wealthy person it had a ballroom on the top floor lovely sprung wooden ballroom. It's fantastic. That was 1980. Um, but the rest of Muskegon was mostly modern. And one of the problems about of, that the Americans found was they, they built lots of houses cheaply with all this wood. But the problem was is that houses built of wood aren't that long lasting, especially if they're built with the lightweight sort of balloon framing in America. And so there were huge numbers of fires and the, the, the wooden infrastructure of America was basically burned down at the end of the 18th, end of the 19th century. So there's the Great Fire of Chicago in, I think, 1872, I think, and loads of other great fires. All these buildings, beautiful to look at, all made of lightweight construction, cheaply made of wood. It even had wooden roads, wooden sidewalks. And of course, all of that is, I'm afraid, incredibly inflammable. So there's not much of Muskegon left. Not much. And um, Chicago is a modern city. There aren't any bit, any old bits of very few old bits of Chicago. Where I came in and I lived in Manchester, for instance, or Hull, where I live now. There's loads of old buildings because they're all burned uh, and they didn't suffer from that fire. So, so we live in a in an old-fashioned sort of way in old Victorian 19th-century buildings. Whereas most Americans live in modern houses which have been built since the Wood Age. Yeah. Um, uh, do, 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 you, do you want to go, go more into to, you know some of the different uh, you know historical events and uh, maybe some old architecture that have been influenced by wood uh, throughout the ages? Well, yeah, the wooden. Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that all the oldest buildings were made were made uh, old halls, uh, long houses uh, of the Stone Age people, all made of wood with lo logs sticking to the ground 
and then put a cross to make the roof. Very much like the houses of the uh, in, that are still built in the, in the Pacific Northwest of, of America and, and in Canada. Very much very similar to that. Uh, and that those sort of buildings carried on being made right up into in Britain into, into Saxon times. People often wanted to make buildings out of stone though, because they felt that was better, that lasted longer, better against fire as well. The problem with building houses out of stone is that stone's hopeless at, at, at riding a roof because it because the material uh, isn't isn't strong enough, it's brittle, it doesn't take tension, and it's very really difficult to make a roof. So most roofs of houses, uh, of buildings, are actually made of wood, and that includes buildings like cathedrals, which have great stone vaulting. You think, oh, that's a fantastic building. It's got stone vaulting. It's got uh, it's got flying buttresses and everything. People go on about these marvelous stone stone uh, cathedrals that we have in Europe. But if you go up into the roof, the actual roof is actually supported by if they do the truss that goes across and and big wooden trunk tree trunk beams across and so even up into even those huge buildings which look stone they're wooden wherever you have a floor and beams and wooden floorboards so all and then if you have a house in in northern europe it gets very cold in winter so most of those houses are also insulated by having wooden paneling inside a lot of the houses and then the little houses in bog, built in boggy areas, places like Venice and Amsterdam uh, and Hamburg, they would sink into the ground. So they're actually supported by huge wooden piles under the soil. So houses are supported from below by wooden piles. They're insulated from within by wooden panelling. And then they've got, they've got wooden floors and then they have wooden roofs. So you might say a house is made of stone and so it only looks like it's made out of stone it's only the walls that are made out of stone and the rest is actually wood yeah so i've, I've actually I've, I've been to to your country um you know uh, mm. england and and scotland you know i've seen some of these uh, older buildings and uh, another thing i've noticed is you know i think more so than england uh, scotland you know it has uh, more wild areas especially you know i'd say it's generally more forested um although it still does have a lot of open area especially around the the highlands and stuff where it's more of the heather type of yeah of area yeah scotland was notorious of being having no trees at all actually 300 mm -hmm. years ago mm -hmm. um it it was um virtually totally deforested mm -hmm. there's a few elements of of the original scots pine cover Caledonian forest it's called there's only about two percent of it left but in it, it's only recently that Scotland has had that those trees that you saw your visit those are mostly American trees they're things like Sitka spruce trees and Douglas fir uh, which are which is over here planted because they grow well in our climate which is similar to the Pacific Northwest um, the reason they are grown is that our, during the First World War, people realised that we didn't have enough wood and that it, because of submarines sinking our ships to bring the wood, then we had a big crisis. And so organisation like the US Forestry Service, the Forestry Commission, in order to, to plant and grow more for trees. And those are the ones that are coating Scotland. They grow quite well and they're quite useful mm. the problem it's so windy here in Britain particularly in Scotland that uh, and, the so and they grow on peaty soils as they tend to blow over a lot more so it's not been entirely successful and we still get that majority of our timber in from Scandinavia from North America Canada and uh, I don't think we'll ever be self in Britain self-sufficient for trees just because our land with most of it is too useful for farmland to 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 allow people to to grow that many trees on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, why is it that they didn't use uh, you know tradition uh, native uh, English or Scottish trees when they're planting them in Scotland? 
Oh yeah. Well, the, the reason for that is that uh, is that those American trees are faster growing. Soft with those conifer trees are straighter, so they're ideal for for modern forestry operations uh, and producing very straight grain bits of wood. But they're not. Uh, whereas uh, our traditional the trees that traditionally grow there are slow growing, a bit bendy and curvy. They used to be useful when people went out and chose individual trees for particular purposes, but for a sort of factory farming of trees like people do now, it's those conifers um, are seen as better. British people don't actually like them, they hate them uh, because they don't have much many, they're not very good for our wildlife. And uh, nowadays there are big campaigns to allow rewilding and for the native trees to return and to allow their seedlings to grow up naturally. And that's something that is uh, starting to happen up, up in Scotland as well as in, as well as in England. Mm -hmm. So, um, one, hold on. Okay. Um, so uh, where I'm from, uh, I actually, I actually, I actually grew up um, in a in a in a log house surrounded, surrounded by a lot of trees, um, right. but also. Wow. Oh, go on. No, I'm just, just impressed. We we all we, we in England we like mm -hmm. wooden houses, but uh, mm -hmm. the building regulations don't really allow mm -hmm. natives to be built. So we, we mm -hmm. find it very exciting to to, to live in a so, nice wooden house. So yeah, it's a a, a log house, um, and uh, you know nearby there's. Uh, a guy, he's, he's not alive anymore, but his name was uh, Robert Troyer. Uh, he was uh, actually, he escaped uh, from Austria, like uh, it was just before World War II. And, uh, you know, he, he, he fought in the war for America. And he started over here in Minnesota, he started a tree farm where he planted. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Robert Troyer, but. Uh, I've heard of him, I'm afraid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, he's a, a very interesting person. The, they, they, of course, they're, they're very good forestry in, in Austria and in, uh, in around the Alps. The, the Austrians, they, they, they have a lot of conifers that then up in the mountains with poor soils. Conifers are the trees that grow best there. Uh, it's in the better land and the better farmed is uh, where broadleaf trees grow. So the first settlers in America uh, were advised when they went to a piece of a new area, they would say, <coughs> don't bother with a place with the area which has got uh, conifers growing on it, go and cut down, cut down the broadleaf trees, and that would be much better farmland. So in Hawaii, Ohio, for instance, uh, beach woodland was considered the land where if you cut it down, you'd get the best farmland. And, uh, and, and so, um, it's it's a good indication. Scandinavia is hard deforested because the farmland is so bad there. It's only con only conifers can can uh, can if you cut them, the land is much good for farming. So it's just left and, and carried on and, and uh, managed for, for for timber rather than trying to grow it and, and grow crops. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I was wondering about. Well, well, I don't know if you mentioned this um, in the book. Uh, what, do you, what, what do you think about uh, you know bonsais and you know also this a similar process also done in China as well? Uh, do, you, do you have anything yeah. to say about that? Well, they're they're really I really like bonsais. They're fantastic, beautiful trees. What they <laughs> they're kept small by being had tiny roots cut off them, <laughs> so that allows them. That prevents them from growing. Then they just grow slowly, and then they they manipulate them. They put wires around them to curl them round into the very romantic forms of those beautiful trees that the the Japanese and Chinese love so much. And it's a fantastic, it's a really fantastic art form. Um, no good for producing wood, but it's a it's a it's a great way of gardening. And and, and these have also been very successful in maintaining their woodlands as well. So Japan is a heavily forested country. Mm. They've got a really good feel for wood and 
uh, I think partly it's because most of their land is is on mountains, so you couldn't really do much else with it. But uh, it's that makes it also a very beautiful kind of all the beautiful uh, conifer forests you get in in Japan, and mm -hmm. they have a lovely bed. Yeah. Um, another thing I want to mention was uh, what, what do you think about uh, you know modern day uh, products that are made out of wood versus you know other materials because obviously wood is a very uh, it's a very versatile product it's uh, you know it's pretty durable you know it's flexible um, or but then there's also as time goes on we're starting to transition to other products which are like plastic which are less sustainable and also you know uh, you know they're not as good for the environment oftentimes lower quality. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a real conundrum. What's happened is that is that wood is a fantastic material, um, and it you can make it into virtually anything. It's got one main problem: is it is that it takes ages to do that um, to cut. You have to carve it, whereas loads of other materials, concrete, plastic, metals, they can all be can all be um, can be shaped more easily they can be put into or rolled and production costs are incredibly cheap so you've got all these other materials steel concrete plastic that can be made cheaper and nowadays you've got things like carbon fiber materials that can actually have better properties than wood uh, because they incorporate those very stiff fibers within the uh, Within a plastic matrix is sort of doing just what wood does actually. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all these other materials. The problem is they all take huge amounts of energy to make them. Um, steel, uh, hun hundred times as much steel. Uh, concrete take uh, making concrete uh, makes up about five percent of the CO2 emissions. Uh, uh, Making plastic is, is hundreds of times more energy expensive than, than wood, and carbon fiber is incredibly uh, en energy intensive, and aluminium also is very highly energy intensive material. So, um, if we can use wood, and we're starting to use wood in big engineering structures as well, uh, then we can get we can stop ourselves using all this energy that otherwise used to make these other materials. And it's uh, I, and I could tell you about some of the exciting big engineering uses of wood uh, that we use nowadays. If you're interested in that, mm -hmm. oh, 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 what was that? You could, yeah, um, because um, we used to. There used to be another final problem with, with wood is that it, you're limited by the shape of trees. Mm -hmm. That's not true anymore. Because nowadays, uh, we not, not only make plywood by using wood veneer and gluing it together with plastic to make sheets of wood, but there's the big uh, modern uh, benefit is being able to make, uh, make uh, laminated wood products, which is basically done by cutting lots of slender planks and then gluing them together. And you can glue them end to end with some finger joints rather like your fingers into digitating that makes a strong joint you can stick glue loads of those little planks together to make a huge plank you can as you do that you can make it into a curve you can make for curved beams and you can make wooden structure wooden beams of any size that you want much bigger than an old tree so nowadays we have uh, been able to make skyscrapers with um, made with wooden beams, uh, the tallest one's about two hundred and seventy foot tall. It's in Norway, uh, and there's another one hundred eighty foot tall one on in University of British Columbia, in uh, in no, uh, I've got what the, up on the west coast of Canada there. And uh, at last, we're able to use wood in ways that mimics and is much more energy efficient uses less than a fifth of the energy to make that building than it would if it was concrete and people are even starting to be able to make glass uh, as of see-through windows out of wood by uh, removing the lignin or or bleaching it and then filling 
the wood up with resin and that makes a nice transparent material which is stronger than glass it's better insulated than, than, than glass and uh, so we could be living in a whole new uh, wooden world in the future that's that's amazing um so what do you think about uh bamboo as a as as a construction material you know it's fast growing yeah. it's very strong uh, yeah bamboo is amazing material it's uh it's it, bamboo isn't a tree isn't a tree of course it's it's a it's a, a large grass mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, which grow and it's if anything it's so full of, of woody material that's much stronger and stiffer than wood it's in a nice tubular shape which makes it incredibly stiff and rigid and it's long been used in the far east for, for structures like in people in indonesia use it to make their long houses in china and japan it's used to make scaffolding rather than using aluminium scaffolding poles you can you can use bamboo ones it's a brilliant material it's a bit one limitation is you can't turn it into sort of flat planks it's difficult to shape so you have to just use it in its in its usual form uh, but uh, I think that there's great opportunities to use if you want to just limit it on, on the uh, shape of the structures you use there's one other interesting aspect of bamboo is that in the Far East, uh, Southeast Asia, there isn't, there are, you don't tend to get many old stone tools from in, uh, in human, old human settlements from the Stone Age. Uh, so there's not, no stone tools. The reason is, is that, is that bamboo, they use bamboo because bamboo not, it's not only stiff and, and strong, it also has, uh, it, it's a grass, it has, has sort of glassy particles in it. And that may means that it's that if you sliver of, of uh, bamboo, it's very very sharp and hard, and so can be used for all the things people used to use their stone tools in the Far East. They 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 tended to use bamboo tools. Of course, they we don't they haven't got them from hundreds of thousands of years ago because they they rot, of course, like wood does. But it's likely that uh, that the Far East they didn't really undergo a stone age. Probably underwent a, a bamboo age. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what, what do you have to say about, uh, the, uh, you know, Asian architecture like China, Japan uh, and wood? Yeah, and Japan and, and China, they, they never really, in their temples, they never really went into making stone buildings. And we tend to think it's rather odd uh, that they didn't make stone buildings. And it's all the more odd because when you use their stone, their wooden buildings, they don't have what we call efficient trusses to hold their roofs up. Our trusses, our roofs, you tend to, if you look in your roof, it tends to have a, a, a triangular arrangement with the wood going in little triangles. That's very stiff in, in the Far East. And, and people have looked down on the, on, on, the, on, the far, on the Chinese as being sort of primitive. But in fact, recent tests have shown that because the fact that you, you've got every, all the bits of joined at right angles in rather and the joints are very loose what that means is that if you have an earthquake the heavy roof of the building can 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 stay still while the rest of the rest of the building sways nothing gets damaged it just sways a bit energy is dissipated in these complex joints they have at the corners called dugong and the building stands up and i've seen tests done by the by Chinese engineers on a scale model of, of a building from the uh, Forbidden Palace in, in Peking. And that's capable of withstanding earthquakes of uh, which are over 10 on the Richter scale. So that's bigger than any earthquake you've ever had. So it's not surprising that those, the uh, Forbidden City in Peking has, has lasted uh, over 600 years. And buildings in Japan, pagodas in Japan, have lasted even longer, so over 1,500 years. And the Japanese pagodas have a special extra device. They have a big pole hanging from the roof. Building sways, the pole sways at a slightly different frequency. It absorbs the energy and 
those pagodas don't fall down in earthquakes either. Uh, whereas San Francisco was totally devastated by its earthquake back mm -hmm. in 1901 or whatever. Yeah, um, you know, woods, woods more flexible properties make it uh, more resistant to earthquakes, not more resistant to fires, uh, but to earthquakes certainly. Well, no. No. Um, no. The good news, the good news is about fires is these modern, huge modern laminated beams are so thick um, that they are very resistant to fires and that they are at their surface and they don't and they don't uh, suffer much damage even in the worst of fires it's, it's different from from the metal frame skyscraper the steel is all too likely to actually be melted by the fire and then just collapse in the heat as the wood uh, manages to stay upright mm -hmm. so it's if you use wood in the right way you can make it flame resistant mm -hmm. Yeah, especially if you use like a heavier wood, maybe like, I, I suppose, I suppose maybe a, a good solid piece of oak, or maybe maybe uh, uh, iron wood uh, would would be good. Or, yeah. Yeah. It's even it's even it's even been said that the in the the, the Soviets when building their space it's going to be a problem when you come back into the Earth's atmosphere, and and, the, and your spacecraft heats up. And the chat, the uh, the American um, shuttles had special tiles on them to to insulate them. Unfortunately, a couple of those broke off once, leading to one of the the, the disaster the of uh, this of the uh, shuttle, one of the two shuttle disasters. In in contrast, some of the some of the Soviets space were just in wood, and as they came through the atmosphere, it just charred on its surface formed a very insulating layer of black sort of charring and mm -hmm. protected their spacecraft better than the specially designed super expensive tiles of the shuttle. Wow, maybe we should start using wood on, on spacecraft more. And, and another, they also, of course, the Soviets are famous for using wooden pencils in space rather than special biros. And that's another cheap, cent, cheap clever little solution whereby using wooden technology rather than having to link up some rather more complex uh, that, that it, it's, it said that, that the Soviets one of the gave them help them in their their sort of race against America in the, in the great space race of the 1960s. Mm -hmm. Okay um, what would you say your f favorite and least favorite woods or trees are? Uh, oh uh, my favourite wood, I love boxwood. That's, I have a lovely treble recorder made out of boxwood. It's a lovely sort of golden, uh, golden slow growing tree. The wood's golden and it makes a lovely, a lovely noise, a uh, uh, lovely nice woody tone. Um, for trees, I, I love ash trees, which are very beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, Those are dying over the, here. Yeah, they're dying in Britain. It's one of the sadnesses. The ash borer. is that uh, yeah you get ash borer we get we have a disease called cholera and one of the problems with that that was brought into britain because forests just have a terrible habit of transferring trees from one part of the globe to the other i don't know why as you were mm -hmm. saying what american trees are doing in britain uh, the in this case it was soviet uh, foresters who moved the mature ash which lives out, out in Asia, and they started growing that um, in in the west of the uh, Soviet Union in, in Russia, and and that had a disease, cholera, which didn't do the Manchurian ash much harm, but unfortunately it's devastating for European ash and I think American ash, and so it's just one of those occasions like chestnut blight brought into America from Japan. Uh, with the movement of trees brings diseases and, and has caused devastation. I, I believe there's hardly any chestnut trees left mm -hmm. in the whole of the States, where it's once a very common and very beloved tree. Yeah. Okay, anyway, so uh, moral is, yeah. So the moral is keep trees where they're supposed to be rather than move them around the globe. I think that's what, what I would say. Yeah, that's good. Um, so anyway, uh, the favorite and, and least trees. Did, uh... 
The ashen oh, boxwood. Favorite, yeah, our least favorite tree. Ooh. I think I like. I no, I don't like. I'm not a great fan of eucalyptus trees. Mm -hmm. uh, they're lovely in Australia, but again, they've been moved to Europe and around the world, and they can form like in Spain and Portugal. They're forming. The, they're growing in trees. They're very, they're very flammable, and that can that's caused some sort of disaster, ecological disaster in, in in some in parts of those countries. Um, but basically, trees are fantastic where they, if they're kept in the, the place where they live in the right place. It's just sad when they they're moved around the globe, and then they they can cause more problems than we think than people would expect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, lemon lemon eucalyptus uh, makes a good bug spray, you know. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, for for me, yeah. uh, oh, go on. What were you gonna say? No, nothing. Okay. Um, so what for me? Probably my, my favorite uh, tree. Probably be, uh, mm. I like a lot. Um, I like the koa wood. Um, in, in Hawaii is a beautiful, beautiful wood. Um, you know, um, I suppose, or, you know, a good, you know, black walnut is, is very nice cherry. Um, uh, yeah. Um, but I, su I suppose for least favorite, I don't know. Um, Yeah, I don't. I don't really have a least favorite uh, that I can think of. <laughs> I don't think. I don't think anyone should have a least favorite tree. Mm -hmm. I think that we need to raise all trees, and and uh, I think you're you're very lucky actually in America because it, uh, in Britain we have. You, I think you have about 170 species of trees in North America in in the United States. 35 species of trees in Britain. Uh, because we've been from from the continent by the North Sea partly, but but Europe doesn't have as many trees as as America. America has different species either side of the Rockies, and they've been able to move north and south uh, during the during and after the ice ages. So Americans have huge numbers of trees compared with us. We've just had to bring. Uh, loads of trees over from America and a lot of our, our landscape gardens are full of beautiful American species like the red oak and uh, uh, and some of your many fine <coughs> conifer trees um, and we only have one species of conifer the the Scots pine and so whenever we have a garden with a cedar or morocco or something we, we get them in from from abroad and, and we really appreciate all these different species of trees that go well in Britain but just don't uh, haven't uh, haven't got here in the past. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you do any uh, uh, carpentry or, or whittling yourself or? I'm very bad at the carpentry. I remember when I was at school doing woodwork I made a mortise and tenon joint and my woodwork teacher was very scathing about it about it wasn't snug like like it should have been um but so i haven't done much i have made a few boats i've made cages to hold insects in and uh but i haven't really got that many brilliant skills i have a brother who makes beautiful model sailing yachts and races mm -hmm. them and he's he's the more skilled one my father built a mini sail a, built a, a, a racing a racing dinghy in our garage when i was a kid but he did swear a lot while he was doing it, so <laughs> he got a bit annoyed. <laughs> so I've always, uh, I, I, I sort of just collect the woods and, and look rather than, rather than doing that much carving myself. And, uh, and I just like to think about things. Sometimes mm -hmm. I like to sit and think, and other times I just like to sit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah, my, my dad is a, is a, bit, is a bit of a, uh, uh, amateur woodworker, you know, he's made, made some really good stuff, you know, some mm. china cabinets, uh, you know, uh, desks, uh, tables, also wow. makes uh, the uh, chairs a little bit. Um, 
I do some, you know, I've, one time I, I carved, um, there's a, a 90s Irish sitcom called Father Ted and I, I carved the main character. Oh yeah, no, well, yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I, I, car <laughs> I carved Father Ted. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I think there's much more of a there's much more of a wood culture in America because you are surrounded by more by trees. Mm -hmm. There's been a tradition of of wooden houses, uh, people people living on wood lots. Our family actually lived in Connecticut when I was a when I was a small child, and we lived in, amongst in a two acre garden with surrounded by some sea woodland. So. Uh, and I, and there's, as you're talking about log cabins and things, there's much mm -hmm. more of a feel for wood in America. Uh, we're yep. in a very denuded uh, area. Part, place I live in, hard, very little wood because originally all the land around here was basically bog, and so there was never any woods here, and it's been it was be it's been sort of drained for farmland. But it means that you rare you don't see any ancient woodland here and uh, and so it's a real delight when you go to America and in fact I, I remember seeing the some of the, the trees on the west coast of around Vancouver and I just couldn't believe how big they were and the first European settlers were blown away when they saw the size of American trees we didn't have anything to like it to compare uh, of course you have some of the biggest trees in the world down in California, and uh, they are totally majestic, and uh, and you just make sure you don't harm those, and you keep those keep those stands. They're so important to get a feel for how amazing uh, nature is, and of course all the the great American nature writers uh, mm -hmm. and uh, were obs obs obsessed. They went to see these trees. They couldn't believe just how fantastic they were, and, uh, and that's the one thing I really envy you over in America is the mm -hmm. fantastic woodland that you have over there. Oh. oh yeah, in fact, hold on, I think I have something that I. Um... Here's here's actually a. Uh, a wooden mallet that I that I have made before. Oh wow! Which is, yeah. Well, so, that's impressive. That's a oak. That's very right impressive. <laughs> yeah. Oh wow. You no, know, I, I've. Uh, I you know, I don't really have anything that I can can say that I'm particularly proud of that I've made out of out of mm -hmm. wood. I used to make plastic models and occasionally mm -hmm. balsa wood models of aeroplane things like that. Yeah, I've but, done that. <laughs> but. Uh, uh, I'm not the. Uh, it's there where I would think both the wood models that I first got into looking at wood and seeing how marvelous it is and uh, and uh, but the weird thing is that why nobody talks about wood or or thinks that wood's important and that's one of the the major things I got out of this out of this book. I always thought wood was important, but I, as I looked into it, there it's more clear how crucial wood was all throughout history. How it shaped the way we think, how it shaped our bodies, how it shaped culture, civilization, and uh, and it's I think so important for us that in the future we don't forget about wood. We don't just live in a, a in in places surrounded by plastic, surrounded by concrete. People feel happier when they're around wood. They like making things out of wood. They enjoy carpentry. Uh, they enjoy walks in the woods, and that's being found particularly now with this with in with these COVID lockdowns. People are really enjoying getting out and about, seeing the trees, doing some handy work. And uh, I think if we can just reduce our consumption of objects and make a few of our own, and just enjoy the wood that surrounds us, I think we'll be will we'll actually be happier people again. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is there anything that you wanted to say that I, I haven't asked you yet or we haven't, we haven't mentioned? Uh, could be from the book or anything else? Um, no, I think that we've covered, we've had a nice, a very nice chat actually, really enjoyed it, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, that 
the thing that I, or, you know, I do want to say is that we've got to be careful about our trees. We've got to look at our forests and we've got to look, look after them. There's an opportunity to use more wood, but we need to think carefully about it. And rather than narrowly uh, use trees in, the, in our sort of uh, industrial way that we're doing nowadays, I think that could, if we carried on doing that, we could actually do more environmental damage. And I think the really important and important take home message is that we need to, to think about how our ancestors used wood, get a feel for, back for, for using wood and for, uh, for, the natural, for the natural world and try and incorporate wood into a sort of smaller scale local economy which will be better for the planet and it will be better for us, I think, and it will make everyone feel a lot happier living in that world. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, I wanted to finish off with just a few words here from a band that, uh, you know, some people might know. Uh, I don't know if people in your country would know this. Uh, it's, a, it's a Norwegian wood. <laughs> um, oh, I know that, yes. Yes. I once had a girl, or should I say, she once had me. She showed me her room, isn't it good? Norwegian wood. She asked me to stay and she told me to sit anywhere. So I looked around and I noticed there wasn't a chair. I sat on the rug, biding my time, drinking her wine. We talked until two and then she said, it's time for bed. She told me she worked in the morning and started to laugh. I told her I didn't and crawled off to sleep in the bath. And when I awoke, I was alone. This bird has flown. So I lit a fire. Isn't it good? Norwegian wood. <laughs> oh, that's lovely. It's a great song. One of the great Beatles. One mm -hmm. of the great Beatles songs. Of course. And uh, and we they they remain as beloved as they've always been over here in in Britain. And of course, they're from from Liverpool, which is on the just a hundred yard, hundred miles from where I live, on the other side of the, of the country, and uh, and they're still looked on as the sort of masters of the, using, a mm -hmm. sort of fusion of, of of rock with English sort of songwriting, mm -hmm. and classing in the songwriting English folk songs, and I think they're fantastic, lovely to hear you say those fun, say those fantastic words because they were fantastic lyricists as well. Absolutely. So um, I think that's about going to wrap it up right there. Um, it's been much. it's been a pleasure talking to you for this episode of Point Counterpoint. I'm your host, Chris Wright. And thank you very much. Yes. Um, long live the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Well, it's been to talk to you, Chris. And it's good Cheers. to see you doing this sort of thing. And uh... And I've really enjoyed it, but I felt very relaxed and uh, had a nice time and talked to you. And uh, uh, it's it's such a it's, I've enjoyed writing the book and uh, and I'm now enjoying talking to people about it. And uh, I even got to talk to a very nice people in a in a radio station for for American truckers down based down in in uh, in Louisiana, and I had no idea idea to be a, a radio station for truckers and and yet they were they were producing all sorts of exciting radio programs mm -hmm. and uh, and it, surprised, it always surprised me how different our countries are very different and yet uh, and you think well america's very uh, but they do things everything's done in a different way we have the bbc you have lots of independent independent radio stations and mm -hmm. independent people and it's great to see how that interest in the world, that surviving in all these different air, at different sources, and, and these people working away on different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. yeah, I've really enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. But we both use the the English system of measurement. Although you're you're starting to switch over, aren't you? Or... Yeah, I I we're sort of halfway in between. My editor for the to use feet and, uh, and and yards and things, whereas half the, half the time in Britain we use meters and centigrade and 
and things but in America mm -hmm. uh, and in Europe they, they use entirely metric so we're always halfway between Europe and America mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's that's our sort of that's our job to be in between I think yeah this this mallet here that I showed is in inches of course <laughs> oh really excellent excellent so in England we still think of our height in, in feet and inches mm -hmm. even though we everything else is in meters uh, but and we think of our weight in but we uh, in imperial units but we think of them in stone was you mm -hmm. talk in pounds we uh, mm -hmm. say i'm 13 stone mm -hmm. we would say that's a hundred and something or other pounds mm -hmm. but uh, so we're linked but are also separated by a common language because i'm not sure if people mean the same thing when you're talking using the same using use slightly different words for the same thing we talk about pavements you talk about sidewalks all mm -hmm. these things are slightly different yeah, absolutely. But, you know, uh, you know, we say yard, you say garden. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. If you have a back, you can have a backyard mm -hmm. that that implies there's nothing green in it, and that you're living in a high density urban area. So, so once I had a yard um, when I was living in a some terraced house uh, in near the centre of York, but uh, we've got a nice garden now. Mm -hmm. And so also you use terms you more talk. like, oh, what's? Maybe you can. Oh, you also use terms more like, you know, attached house, semi-detached. Um, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what your equivalents are in America. So um, we, have, we have terrace. Uh, mm, I'm not really I sure. Know. No, we have, I'm, I live in a semi-detached now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> most common house in britain <laughs> mm -hmm. i like the way in keeping up appearances she always talk, talks about I, it's a richard it's a semi-detached house <laughs> it's very funny that she's that's a great comedy <laughs> we're, not, we're not common we're not common like onslow <laughs> Oh dear, so funny. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I better I better call off now. I'm due to I'm on um, cooking duty tonight. I'm due to cook a oh. have a cook a um, curry. I think tonight. Okay, very nice. Okay, it's been good that, talking to you. Be, yep, that's been fantastic. Yeah, lovely, you? nice chat. Yep. Okay. Well, thanks, and uh, let me know. Let me know the finished thing and uh, I'll look forward and I wish you all the best in your career. Yes. Are you planning to, what, what's your career plans? Um, so I'm a, I'm an, I'm a senior at the University of St. Thomas, uh, psychology and Spanish major. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, looking for, you know, clinical psychology. Um, oh, really? My, uh, oh, that, yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Where's the Spanish coming? Hmm? <laughs> where, where? Yeah. It helps in, you know, communication with, you know, all sorts of different people, you know, speak Spanish, English. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very useful. We, we tend to go on holidays to uh, to the Canary Islands, which belong to Spain. Mm -hmm. It's a sort of equivalent in Britain. If you go down to Florida or, mm -hmm. or, or, or Mexico, we go down to the Canary Islands in the, mm -hmm. in the middle of winter. And it's actually really beautiful and, and reasonable weather and, gets away from all the dark of the cold dark of the English of the English winter which yeah. is very depressing and, and Spain and Portugal are also big uh, vacation spots too um, yeah they're, they're more in the summer but the, the uh, in, in they're quite wet and damp in the winter so so the Canary Islands being that much further south they're really they, they stay sunny and mm -hmm. uh, they're very popular with the British tourists and, uh, and tourists from Germany as well I know in the I know in the movie for Are You Being Served they they went to on vacation to to Spain, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's all sorts of gradations of places to go to Spain, but it's but it's, it's all beautiful. Uh, we go to we've been to Mallorca a lot as well. Very common uh, mm -hmm. holiday destination. A very beautiful island as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, Spanish mm -hmm. is very nice. So we always yeah. enjoy that. I'm not sure if you've if you watch Are You Being Served or. Mm. Oh yeah, yeah, I used to, I, I I was there first time round in the seventies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bit sort of non, bit non really, but uh, mm -hmm. it, um, a bit sort okay. of 
rough and rather rough and ready, but it's a bit hilarious as well. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, mm-hmm. I better go actually. All right. So, cheers then, Chris. Yep, cheers.